Dzień dobry, nazywam się Beata Majchrowska, jestem dziennikarką, historykiem sztuki, ale też osobą mocno zanurzoną w tematyce enigmy. Kończę biografię Antoniego Paluta i dzięki tej książce miałam przyjemność poznać naszego dzisiejszego gościa, Sera Delmota Turinga, który przyjechał otwierać konferencję w Kliczkowie, trzecią edycję. Hello, welcome to Poland. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming and it's nice. I hope you, you like the place and it's the a, idea of the conference. It's a lovely place. It's a great conference and uh, thank you for having me. Yeah. Do you like the discussion after the, your talk? Well, Was there it were, interesting? There were lots of questions. So um, people obviously find the subject very uh, interesting. That's very, obviously very pleasing um, when, when, when that happens. So we had to... Uh, turn away some people who wanted to ask questions because we ran out of time. But you know that's all. That's all great. Okay. <laughs> Coming back to your book, while doing your research for for the book, which is great, uh, did you find something really um, new um, that you never found before in any books on Enigma? Something that is your private revelation? Well, yes, I did. And one of the things that was very exciting. Um, was the declassification in France of the personal archives of Gustave Bertrand. Bertrand turns out to be a key figure in the whole story because it was Bertrand that brought the Enigma documents to Poland, the ones that helped Marian Rievsky with his um, work on uh, reconstructing the Enigma machine. And later on, it's Bertrand that brought the Poles, the French and the British together into a three-cornered alliance for sharing of Enigma intelligence. So to discover his documents, and I was one of the first people to be allowed to see this amazing collection of stuff, and it really brings the story... Uh, you know, I mean, it was a completely new perspective on the story... I knew that Rievsky had done this amazing mathematical work, but to understand that it was not just Poland working on its own, but there was this alliance between the three countries, that was that was very, very exciting to discover that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have, I have to ask you a question that I am personally obsessed. Um, did you ever think that Poles should have shared secrets with their allies earlier and what would happen if the, that wouldn't be five weeks before the war? It would change the, the situation for this, the war? Yeah, this is, a very, this is a very interesting problem which um, I have to say I had to think about very hard um, while I was uh, doing my research. Why... So there's two sides of this story. One is why did the Poles keep the, their discoveries a secret um, for so long? Was it not unfair? <laughs> the agreement was not to share Because the, the agreement was to share, but then there's the other side of the thing, which is what made them change their minds? And if you think about this, it all, this is a very modern question. This is a question that happens all the time for people who are in alliances and have possession of secret information, mm -hmm. when is it safe to share something with your allies? People who are your allies today may become your enemies tomorrow. And if you think about what happened in World War II with, let's just take the French for example, if the Poles had shared their Enigma knowledge with the French and if the French had then gone into uh, an alliance with the Germans, which is kind of what happened after the Vichy regime mm. took over, that could have been, you know, that could have had devastating consequences. So it, that, that whole decision to share, regardless of that agreement about sharing things, to, was, I think, a very difficult one for Polish mm. military intelligence to take. So... You ultimately nobody writes down the reasons for mm -hmm. these decisions, so you have to 
build up a picture and understand what was in 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 their minds at the time. But um, yeah, I think I think that whole question and what might have happened if they'd shared earlier or if they had not shared at all. It, 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 you know, one can imagine a very different outcome to at least the early years of the war. But the British also kept something in reserve. They were traditionally uh, sceptical uh, about French people and also about Polish. Well, they um, didn't say everything. Or... Uh, well, that's true, but I think what, from a, the British foreign policy objectives in the 1930s were to ensure that Britain did not get dragged into another world war. Mm -hmm. And so this was what was driving all British decision making right up until at least 1938 and possibly further on. So um, that meant that first of all Britain was focused on protecting its navy and to some extent the empire and really not at all thinking about what could benefit Britain from sharing anything that it knew and, and because the whole idea was to keep away from it all and I think it was only by the time it became inescapable that Britain would get involved in another war with Germany that uh, then things started to ease a little bit but I, I still think the British were very sceptical probably throughout the whole war even sharing with the Americans was something that the British found very difficult to do mm -hmm. so um, and there were things that were not shared with Americans. They had a special code word for documents that were not to be shared with the Americans. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, but is this unusual? I don't think it is. I think all countries have this question going through their head the whole time. Is mm -hmm. it safe to share this? Is it safe to share that? What do I get from it if I share this? You know, these questions are mm -hmm. all there all the time. Um, when you got the idea to write a book and why actually? Uh, more historical reasons or literature? Um, a bit of both. Um, okay, so in Poland the story about the Polish code breakers and Enigma is reasonably well known. Uh, in Britain, I, I hope it's better known now, but when I started this project um, there was very little available in Britain about the subject. Um, no books have been written about the Polish code breakers in English since the early 1980s. There was one book that was written in the early 1980s and there was one translation of a book written by a Polish historian um, and that was very difficult to get hold of. So essentially there wasn't really anything that was telling the story and we kind of knew that the Poles had had some involvement but what mm -hmm. was it? How significant was it? Um, all these questions and so when I discovered that I could not find out the answers by just going and buying a book uh, I thought well let's try and find out for myself and mm -hmm. so um, uh, that's that's how it began and it really also began out of um, wanting to know from a personal standpoint um, I wanted to understand a bit more about where Alan Turing's invention of the bomb had come from what had inspired it and mm -hmm. uh, um, we knew it was called the bomb because it was a uh, homage to the Polish bomber but again that that just that wasn't really an answer, that was just a reframing of the question. What was the contribution that the Poles had made? Why was it so significant? Why can't I find out anything about this? So that's, that's I think, where it all started. For example, the famous film, The Imitation Game, uh, doesn't say much about Polish uh, code breakers. So but what it, it says about the British the... code breakers is all wrong as well, so... <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think the film needs a proper prequel based on your book? Well, that would be very that would be very nice. Um, let's hope that if somebody does decide to do that, then they can uh, do something that's 
makes uh, let's say the imitation game is a great movie even if it's not great history yeah. maybe it's possible to do both and make a great movie as well as uh, do good history but uh, there yeah, are so a lot of histories there uh, hidden stories so yes. it's good for a film yes. with Brad Pitt as a bad friend or someone you want you want <laughs> Brad Pitt to be in it okay um, yeah so I can think of some uh, it, I mean, it's actually quite hard to find uh, actors who will play mathematicians and people who don't have, you know, action action <laughs> roles. But uh, um, maybe we could revive Benedict Cumberbatch's role. We could have him playing Marion Rievsky. What, 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 what do you What do you think? Yeah, yeah good idea. <laughs> and we need some. We need some glamorous women. This is a problem for the story. Is that there are um, um. there are only a few. Uh, women in the story, um, but some of them are quite strong, interesting characters, and it would be nice to... Pallet's wife is a strong character. Pallet's Palette, wife is a very interesting character. Um, Pallet's wife um, has her small role to play in keeping the secret, and in particular keeping the secret of what had happened to the Polish codebreakers. The Germans were so desperate to get their hands on the Polish codebreakers to find out what they knew. And Mrs. Pallot was able to face down the Gestapo, and I think that that, for me, was a very powerful chapter in the story when her son told me about what he had seen as a small child when the Gestapo uh, came to uh, call in their flat. and. Uh, most women would have said to their children, go and hide, but she told her son, Yerji, that he should stay and watch so that he could bear witness in later years. And then when he told me his story, that's what he was doing, he was bearing witness. So he I told got me to... the same story, yeah. I was lucky. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and uh, it was only a few weeks after I had interviewed him that, uh, uh, that I heard that he had died. So I was very, very, um, honoured to be able to receive it from him first hand just, uh, just a few weeks before, before he passed away.